Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Leanna if you're new, and my favorite Disney princess is Cinderella. Should it be Mulan because she's badass and also the only Asian one, even though she's not a princess because she married a general, not a prince? Yes, it should be Mulan, but it's Cinderella. And today I'm gonna tell you why. Don't ask me why I'm doing this super off-brand video that literally nobody asked for, but I just feel like Cinderella is so misunderstood and I really wanted to make this video because I will not sit here while my girl gets disrespected. <laughs> Not like she needs an offending, not like she perfectly fits the western booty standard of her time, not like she has a castle and a handsome prince and just a lot of money at this point. She doesn't need me to defend her, honestly, but I'm going to do it anyway. Also, I think it is crucial to mention at this point that I do not mean Once Upon a Time Cinderella or Live Action Cinderella or Into the Woods Cinderella, especially not Into the Woods Cinderella. And the reason for this distinction is because I feel like a lot of adaptations don't do the character justice. And by a lot of adaptations, I mean all of them. So if you didn't already get this, I'm talking about the Disney cartoon Cinderella. For the sake of this video, I watched the three cartoon Cinderella movies that Disney came out with. Cinderella 1, the 1950 version, Cinderella 2, Dreams Come True, released in 2002, and then Cinderella 3, A Twist in Time, released in 2007. I've seen all three of these movies a gajillion times, but I really wanted to make sure that they were fresh in my mind so that I am fully equipped to make a good argument to convince you that Cinderella should be your favorite princess. Now there's a significant time gap between the release of the first film and the release of the subsequent two. Um, so large that literally the second wave of feminism literally had time to happen and women's roles in society drastically changed. Because of this, the way her character was written in the second and third movie is a little bit more modern than she was in the first movie to cater to more modern audiences, which makes sense. And definitely, if it weren't for the third movie, she definitely, definitely would not be my favorite princess. That's no question at all. The third movie really, really just makes the Cinderella character just top tier. But we'll get to that. But what I'm trying to say is, even still, the Cinderella in the first movie is still a really, really great character that I feel like people tend to kind of uh, gloss over <laughs> because the 1950 film is based on the classic Cinderella story, the one that everybody knows. The, you know, um, servant girl goes from rags to riches. She has like evil step sisters and stepmother and she marries a prince as talking mice friends, you know, becomes a princess at the end. Everybody knows that story, I feel like. So I'm aware based on that, the general conception of her, based on that story that almost everyone knows is that she's weak, um, she's a gold digger, um, and just got swept off her feet by a handsome prince without having to do much work for it, without trying at all. So I understand why Cinderella is seen as not a super great role model for young girls, but the character of Cinderella in the 1950 Disney film has a lot of things about her that I think make her a great role model. Now I'm just talking about her in the first film right now, and I'll get into the latter two a bit later, which do a lot more to further my point that she is a great role model and not weak at all, contrary to popular belief. So first and foremost, let's dive into the first movie. This one is based on the centuries-old OG Cinderella story, ending with her marrying the prince after trying on the glass slipper. I love this movie so much. It's really nostalgic, reminds me of my childhood. I just love the transatlantic accent. If you don't know what that is, it's the combination of British and American English uh, that was considered very prestigious back in the 20th century, so they used it a lot in the entertainment industry, which is why in old-timey American movies they talk a little bit different than we do. Um, and I just love that accent. It's just like very reminiscent of uh, the movies that I watched in my childhood. I, I just love the sound of the songs, especially um, So This Is Love when she's dancing with the prince. It was like, so this is love, so this is love. It just sounds like very like old-timey and I'm just like, I'm here for this. So since I'm assuming we all know the story and most of us have seen this movie, I'm just gonna jump right into it. In every Cinderella adaptation there is, the one main thing that remains constant about her is that she remains kind and gentle despite being forced to become a servant in her own home and being abused by her stepmother and stepsisters, which first off is already a really great thing about her. Each Disney princess has struggles unique to them, but I feel like Cinderella is very special. To make this point, let's consider some other Disney princesses. Belle, she had her father. He loved her very much. Ariel had a father. Uh, loved her very much, even though he was strict. Snow White. Well, Snow White actually had it pretty rough with the evil queen, so I'll give her that one. But Cinderella is basically the only Disney princess that I can think of who lost both her parents and then had to endure such 
suffering like right before her eyes and just know what was going on the entire time you know one could argue snow white lost to both her parents too but the thing with snow white is that she didn't really know that the queen had it out for her so you know how like people say ignorance is bliss so she was kind of living in like a state of blissful ignorance and she just didn't even know that the queen wanted to kill her until the huntsman took her out to the forest and then like pulled the knife on her and she was like oh my god my stepmother wants to kill me you know one could also argue that rapunzel lost both her parents because gothel kidnapped her at a very young age but then also like rapunzel didn't know who her parents were she thought that gothel was her real mother and to be fair gothel kind of treated her uh, relatively well in her own twisted way and tried to foster a mother-daughter bond with her so I feel like Cinderella out of all the Disney princesses had it pretty bad because she had to deal with the death of both her parents and then she just grew up being forced to become a servant in her own home like she knew what was happening the entire time and still she remained kind and gentle and unresentful like what a role model teaching people to hang on to hope to not let resentment wash over you no matter how bad people treat you, to remain kind in times of despair. So I would say that's one reason why Cinderella is really great, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now one big theme in the story is hope, and holding on to the hope that maybe your dreams can come true one day, if you just believe. Now people like to criticize this because uh, they see this as just her hoping that, you know, maybe one day things will get better, and not actually like being a go-getter and uh, finding her happiness herself. I think the most accountability being demanded here is from Cinderella herself as opposed to from the people who are abusing her like instead of being like oh they're evil maybe they shouldn't be evil we're just like oh Cinderella sucks for not standing up for herself um I think we're putting the focus on the wrong person here I think this is a prime example of toxic feminism blaming the women who aren't in these stereotypical girl boss roles for being oppressed instead of blaming the oppressors is anti-feminist. Saying that she is a terrible example for young girls for not standing up for herself when she was being abused is toxic femininity. Like, I, I just, there's no other way to explain it. Like, I, I can't think of another way to explain it. To continue my point, instead of staying home and letting herself be abused, what could she have done? Run away? Become homeless? Go on the internet? Apply for a job? Become an engineer? Like, what, 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 what could she have done? First of all, it was medieval France, okay? And she was a woman, a woman with no money of her own because Tremaine took it all. And also that's her dad's house. That's the only thing that she has left of him. Was she supposed to just up and leave? That was supposed to be her house. So she stayed because she stayed and she didn't run away. I feel like Cinderella gets a lot of hate, like a lot more than Snow White for waiting for a prince to come and save her when Snow White's the one actually with a song titled Someday my prince will come. Like, are we gonna pretend that's Cinderella's song? It's not Cinderella's song. Exhibit A of Cinderella Shaming is the Cheetah Girl song, Cinderella. And the lyrics go like, I don't wanna be like Cinderella, sitting in a dark, cold, dusty cell, waiting for somebody to come and rescue me. And first of all, what a bop. I have that song on my iPod, but the lyrics are very problematic. Firstly, she wasn't looking to get rescued. She was looking for happiness which is very evident in her song, A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes. Nowhere in that song does she mention wanting to be rescued by anyone. That was her I Want song. You know how Simba in The Lion King says, can't wait to be king, uh, Ariel, part of your world. Like, it, it, it shows what the character wants. Snow White's I Want song was Someday My Mission Will Come. Cinderella's I Want song is A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes, I think. So she was looking for happiness and she had very limited resources to go after that happiness. All she knew was that there was a great big castle right outside her window that she woke up to every single morning. I mean, if I woke up to the sight of a great big castle every morning, you know, that would probably, that sight would probably hold some magic for me. Like I would probably associate that distant world just out of reach and I would associate that with happiness. Not once does she care about the prince at all. When she gets the invitation to the ball in the mail, all she's looking for is one night out in this really pretty palace that she's like obsessed with in her mind. It's Anastasia and Drizella gushing over the idea of dancing with the prince. That's exactly how they say it. <laughs> the prince. <laughs> They're the gold diggers, not Cinderella. Cinderella may have danced with the prince at the ball, but she didn't even know he was the prince. I know this because right before she leaves, he asks her, why do you gotta leave? And she's probably like, oh, well, I don't want to explain the whole spell thing to him because it's like too much work and he won't believe me. <laughs> so she's just like, oh, well, um, I have to go because I haven't danced with the prince. Uh, yeah, and he's like, the prince? But didn't you know I'm the prince? But she leaves before he gets to tell her. So 
One night out in the palace would have been enough for her. When the godmother tells her the spell will be broken at midnight, she looks so grateful, so content. Like, she says, this is more than I could have ever hoped for. And after the spell is broken and she's just on the side of the road, just holding on to the glass slipper, she looks so blissful and grateful, like she just got everything she ever wanted, and she did. That was all she wanted, one night out. Also, she didn't tell the prince her name because she likely thought that she was going to spend a good portion of the future continuing to tend to her stepmother and stepsisters and living in that house. So it's not like she was looking for a rescuer. Like, regardless of who this man was, like, regardless if he was a prince, maybe he could have been some nobleman or just some random dude. She could have been like, my name's Cinderella, come pick me up tomorrow. I need to escape with you. Like, it wasn't like that. She, she didn't even tell him her name. And he had to resort to, you know, finding the maiden based on her shoe. And, you know, people always like to complain, like, oh, the prince is so stupid, like, as if there's not more than one maiden with, like, the same shoe size. But I don't think there was a lot of size fours. <laughs> Maybe he was onto something. Another argument is that the fairy godmother gave her everything, and she wouldn't have done anything to try to get to the ball if it weren't for the fairy godmother. We're gonna get a little abstract here, okay? So for me, it's very clear that Cinderella is very hopeful from the beginning. We see her gushing over the palace, um, saying maybe one day, singing about her dreams to be happy, and the only reason that she's able to get up every day and go through the same routine of just, you know, chores, 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 getting yelled at, getting abused, is because she has that hope, and maybe one day she'll be happy. And because of that hope, she manifests the fairy godmother, which means she is responsible for sending herself to the ball. When the fairy godmother shows up, she says this one line, if you lost all your faith, I couldn't be here, and here I am. Which means that she's only there because of Cinderella's belief. So that makes me think that Cinderella manifested this fairy godmother for her and sent herself to the ball. Furthermore, contrary to what the Cheetah Girls song lyrics say, she didn't just, you know, sit there in a cellar and wait to be rescued. She was busy taking care of people. She considered her family. We, we can't fault her for that. All throughout the movie, they're treating her like shit, and she tries to consider them family and give them the benefit of the doubt in several, several situations. Like, she gives them so many chances. This is not just seen in the first movie, it's seen in the subsequent movies as well. But yeah, she constantly gives them the benefit of the doubt because she doesn't want to make them her enemy. She wants to be their family. A prime example of this is when she shows up in the room, she's like, wait for me! She obviously intends to go with them and she trusts them to like not do anything to her, but they end up tearing her dress to shreds. Like, I don't know if that's just, I don't know if that's just being too trusting of people who have proved time and time again that they're evil, but uh, maybe that's just one of Cinderella's weaknesses. I guess it could also be considered a good thing that she gave them so many chances to be her family because it shows her kindness. It's easy for people in the audience to be like, oh, she's dumb for trusting them, but that's because of what we know. Her stepfamily is evil. They're literally named the evil stepmother and the evil stepsisters. From her perspective, from Cinderella's perspective, she probably doesn't think they're evil. They're just not nice to her, but they're still her family. You know, how was she supposed to know that they were literally gonna tear her dress up? This benefit of the doubt is exactly what allows her to forgive Anastasia in the second and third movie, which I will get into. You know, not that she really held anything against her in the first place. Even though she forgives easily, she doesn't forget. Maybe the dress tearing or her stepmother locking her in the attic when the duke comes is her wake-up call. And by not forgetting, I mean she left them in the chateau when she marries the prince. Uh, she left them in the house. She could have easily been like, hey, can my family come with me and live with me? I don't know if that's allowed to happen when the prince marries a commoner, but she left them there and cut ties and, you know, doesn't try to exact revenge. She's like, okay, bye, like, I'm out, we're done. Now, let's talk about Cinderella's strength. Yes, Cinderella is very strong and very resilient. We see this through her endurance of her shitty situation and, you know, not even holding any grudges. One thing that I noticed that Cinderella did a lot was wait until she was in private to show signs of frustration or weakness. Like most of the time, you would see her crying in private. I'm not trying to say that I think crying in front of people is a sign of weakness or that, you know, restraining your emotions is a sign of strength, but I think she was worried about being perceived as weak, so, you know, that was her way of protecting herself from further abuse because if they thought she was weak, then they probably would have tried to take advantage of her even more than they already did. So uh, that was her way of protecting herself, I think. 
Now, I did notice she kind of did cry and beg for Tremaine to not lock her in the attic uh, when the Duke was on the way, and then shouted through the door at her, like, no, please, you can't do this, and she was, like, kind of crying. But I think that emotional reaction was very warranted in that situation because that was Tremaine's most aggressive uh, power move throughout the whole entire movie, which probably came as a shock since for most of the movie she is still very aggressive but also like very passively so like when she sees cinderella in the dress that the mice made for her and then she like kind of hints at drizella and anastasia like girls don't you think her her beads are nice and then drizella is just like wait those are my beads so like tremaine is like very passive aggressive and she kind of like wants other people to do her dirty work for her but locking cinderella in the attic was her most active aggressive move and so i feel like cinderella probably was kind of shocked but in all the other scenes where they're like really mean to her she always like kind of runs to her own room and then like cries for a little bit speaking of cinderella being strong and putting on a good face for people and having dignity this is also shown in cinderella too where she's having trouble adjusting to becoming a princess and she falls on her butt during a dance lesson and then she calmly gets up leaves and goes to her room to cry i think that's very relatable wanting to save face you know even though the people trying to train her weren't as evil as the stepmother and stepsister they were still the antagonists of the story and they were trying to get her to conform and she just didn't want to seem weak in front of them because then they would think that she's incompetent but they kind of already thought she was incompetent she didn't want them to think that she was more incompetent than they already thought she was so now let's talk about shock and gus the mice okay we love shock and gus <laughs> Cinderella owes a lot to these two along with the other mice and birds and also her dog Bruno that helps her several times in the three movies um, I think I think he actually only showed up in the first one and I, I don't want to discredit their heroism or cheapen it in any way they're great characters and it's not all because of Cinderella but one thing my grandma says is if you love them they'll love you back you get back what you put out into this world I think that's very true especially in this case the mice love her they, they risk their lives several several times for her even if it's not like a big deal like even when they were just trying to get materials for her dress and then they get like chased by lucifer like they they risk their lives time and time again just to help her in their eyes risking their lives is worth it and in cinderella 2 jacques literally changes his genetic dna so that he can help her better like imagine being so kind that you know someone would literally die for you if you ask me, she's the epitome of you get what you put out into the world. She treats her animal friends like friends. She doesn't see them as beneath her just because they're animals. So this is another case of her unlimited and unconditional kindness. So another really great quality about her and something that makes her very, very likable in my opinion is that she is kind of sassy. <laughs> You're like, what? Cinderella sassy? <laughs> well, what I mean is that she finds the joy in shitty situations and you know she has a sense of humor about it and it makes the viewer really like her she's being reduced to a maid right but instead of being all boohoo and just like throwing a sob fest she finds joy and we often see her joking around there's this one scene early in the movie where she's trying to tell bruno that he and lucifer have to get along and then she goes like oh come on there must be something good about lucifer for one thing he sometimes he hmm there has to be something good about him <laughs> and i'm like damn she's sassy and later in the movie when she gets the invitation in the mail and anastasia and drizella are upstairs playing the flute and singing like hella off key she looks to jacques and gus and she's like maybe i should interrupt the music lessons <laughs> catching little sparks of her sass throughout the movie is really entertaining and it makes her a really likable and relatable character because it just shows that she's she has spirit still she like her spirit isn't crushed just because of her situation and it, it shows that she isn't feeling bad for herself the entire time and um i think this is a really great example to us because you know life is hard and it's really easy to wallow in self-pity or we could just make the best out of the situation and just do our best to be happy with what we're given so now we're moving into Cinderella 2. This is the first time that we get to see her at her peak. Like she's no longer being abused. The world is her oyster. Uh, she she can find happiness now. She's just flourishing. So we really get to like see who she is like outside of being a maid. So this movie is split into three separate 15 minute stories that have nothing to do with each other. And I feel like out of the three movies, this one is the most unnecessary, but I feel like there's still something to explore here. There's still a bone to pick here. So let's start with the first story of this second movie. This story is of her arrival to the palace after her honeymoon with the prince 
and you know they f and immediately when she gets back the king tells her that she has to plan the royal banquet and she's like omg i have no idea how to be a princess and it's true she has no idea how to be a princess so it's very stressful and even worse uh right as she is assigned this duty her prince has to leave on some royal political business with the king so she's just kind of like by herself and um, she is being trained by this lady in waiting, Prudence, who is just very like uptight and stuffy and has a British accent. Like almost all antagonists have a British accent, even if it doesn't make sense. Why? <laughs> so before the prince got married to Cinderella, Prudence was the one planning this banquet. And you know, she is used to things being done a certain way and it's all very stuffy. Like there's a lot of corsets, a lot of like stiff dancing, like prim and proper dance music and um, prunes for dessert. And every time Cinderella tries to suggest something, Prudence shuts it down and she goes like, it simply isn't done. And she says this like 10,000 times in the 15 minutes of this story. So this is not Cinderella at all. She is left frustrated and sad and has a good cry about it. Also, I think it's important to clarify here that she was frustrated because they were trying to kind of make her fit into this mold like they were like putting courses on her and it was just all very uncomfortable and then they were like you know picking apart her dancing making her pick between two colors that are basically the same and she was just getting really really overwhelmed and then she realizes that it's not her and she says i want to plan this banquet my way and she takes charge she does this all knowing that the prince or the king expects this banquet to be done a certain way she's very very um, adamantly going against tradition and almost recklessly so because the king could get really mad with all these changes like she's a trailblazer she's not afraid to do things even though it's never been done and you know she stays true to herself without compromise she does this all without permission from anyone this is a great lesson about not trying to be someone you're not aside from that another small detail of this short that i really liked was that she took her mice friends to the palace with her she's loyal as and it just furthers my point that she treats them like friends instead of just animals. Also, her first morning in the palace, she wakes up bright and early and starts making her own breakfast. Much to the disapproval of Prudence, who's like, a princess should never make her own breakfast. <laughs> to which Cinderella responds, like, there are rules about breakfast? She remains humble after becoming a princess and she didn't let the status get to her head she was like fine making her own breakfast she wasn't about to have people wait on her so those are all the points i wanted to make about the first one so the second story revolves around shock this is the one where he changes his genetic dna right so he becomes human basically he becomes frustrated that he can't help her because he's so small and um so he asked the fairy godmother to turn him human there's honestly not that much to say for cinderella in this one because it's jacques story but um one thing i noticed was that she was always grateful for whatever the animals did for her like in the beginning Jacques and gus are like picking flowers in the garden for her and then they come back to the duke giving her like a big ass bouquet of flowers and then they're like so disappointed because they only got like five like little flowers even though it was like so hard for them to like carry it like she's always really grateful for them she she was like oh these are beautiful thank you and like right after the flower she has to like go to this meeting and then she like forgets a piece of paper important for the meeting and then Jacques tries to bring it to her and then he gets seen by the other guests and then chaos ensues they're like ah a mouse tables are flipped like dishes are broken and cinderella's not mad at him she tries to comfort him and she sees that he really wants to help her so she offers him a chance to help her the next day and that is how friends should treat each other so the third and final story of the second movie is about anastasia's search for love this is also a really big aspect of the third movie as well and it's really interesting seeing her develop as a character and we see that she's not just one-dimensional um cinderella in this one helps her stepsister find love with the town baker she's a little bit of a meddler but uh you know she's doing it because she thinks everybody's deserving of love and anastasia is deserving of that too and she even takes anastasia back to the palace and gives her a makeover and doesn't hold anything against her for what she did to her in the past anastasia's redemption and cinderella's forgiveness of her is explored further in the third film which i am finally getting into now so cinderella 3 this movie was a cinematic masterpiece that is just non-negotiable okay i'm gonna spoil a lot of it so i would recommend that you go like watch it on disney plus or something you probably won't even know what i'm talking about unless you like have seen it but if you're still here and you want to like hear me talk about it i just know i'm gonna spoil it but it's still worth watching afterwards just to like see find out how it ends this movie is the main reason why i love cinderella so much as i mentioned in the beginning of this video even though i said she was already really strong in the first one this movie really makes her 
twice as strong. This movie is not only a great movie about love and redemption and forgiveness, but also furthers my point about Cinderella being a bad bitch. So here we go. So in the opening scene of this movie, we see Cinderella and her prince um, on their one year anniversary after getting married. They're like super happy. Um, they like go to the woods to meet up with the fairy godmother who has this whole like celebration for them and Anastasia sees them in the woods or she sees them pass by the house and then she follows them into the woods. She's just kind of like spying on them the whole time and she's like that's how Cinderella did it. Magic. So the fairy godmother loses the wand. Like how do you lose the most important thing on you? Like I don't understand <laughs> but she loses it. She loses it. Lo and behold Anastasia gets her hands on the wand. So that means the stepmother now has her hands on the wands and she is the most evil one so obviously she's going to do something super evil she is set on getting revenge on cinderella so tremaine uses the wand to turn back time to the moment that the duke came over for the shoe fitting and she magics the shoe to fit Anastasia. And Cinderella is just like coming down the stairs like after she came out of the attic. She sees Anastasia with the shoe on and she's like, what? No, like this isn't right. So after they leave for the palace, obviously Cinderella is like hella devastated. She's like, what happened? Like, I don't understand. But then she eventually comes to the realization that the prince knows he danced with her that night. So easy solution, she's just gonna go to the palace and find him. Meanwhile at the palace, the prince sees Anastasia and he's like, nah, sorry, it wasn't you. Then the evil stepmother hypnotizes him, makes him think that he danced with Anastasia. And then he's like, okay, cool, let's get married. So Cinderella gets to the palace, she meets up with the prince, and she's just like, hey! And he's like, who are you? <laughs> and she's like, no! <laughs> but instead of giving up, she tries to find out how to fix it for love. So basically Jacques and Gus witness the stepmother hypnotizing the prince. So they rush off to tell Cinderella, and she's like, OMG, like, magic. So she gets, she devises this plan to get the wand back from them. And she actually does get it back from them, with the help of Jacques and Gus, of course. And she devises this whole plan where she can get the prince in the same room as her, so she can reverse the spell with the wand. But it's her and her animal friends against literally all the palace guards. So Tremaine's like, chase after that girl. She's a thief. She stole something for me, from me. Inevitably, she gets caught. She doesn't have time to reverse the spell on the prince. And Tremaine banishes her from the land. Jacques and Gus get the prince and tell him he's under a spell. And then he saves her. Man, she owes Jacques and Gus everything. <laughs> so yes, this is the whole damsel in distress situation that like everybody hates. Um, but there wasn't much she could do. And also imagine what she felt like thinking that she had no method to make him remember her. It was about time to give up. She wasn't delusional, right? So all is fine. He brings her back. The spell is broken. He's not hypnotized anymore. He remembers that it's Cinderella. So then they go back to the palace, but the stepmother isn't ready to give up. She tries to banish Cinderella one more time and magics her away into this rotting pumpkin carriage with Lucifer as the coachman with the intention of killing her. She's like, make sure she doesn't come back alive and uses magic to make Anastasia look exactly like Cinderella. So, you know, the prince will think he's marrying Cinderella, but it'll be Anastasia. So what does Cinderella do? She body slams her way out of the pumpkin. <laughs> Survival instincts kicked in. Saves the mice from Lucifer. And then she fucking jumps onto the horse and prevents them all from falling down a fucking ravine. Like, are you kidding me? After she gets herself out of that pumpkin situation, <laughs> Jacques goes like, now what are we gonna do? And she says, well, I'm not gonna miss my own wedding. And in that moment, she's audibly claiming ownership of her happy ending the happy ending that belongs to her. For really the first time, the character development, yo. And then she rides the horse like a seasoned equestrian all the way to the palace in messy hair, torn dress, and tries to crash the wedding. Meanwhile, at the wedding, Anastasia is feeling super guilty. She doesn't think it's right. She doesn't want to go through with the marriage because she knows it's a lie and the prince doesn't love her, obviously. She just wants someone to love her. So she basically says, I don't. And the stepmother gets really, really mad at Anastasia uh, for not saying I do. Like, after all I've done for you, you ungrateful little blah, 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 and threatens to turn her into a toad. And in this moment, Cinderella busts in. I think she busted in like a few seconds earlier, but she steps in front of Anastasia to protect her, even after everything. 
<laughs> and this is like an alternate timeline from the second movie, right? So I think the the Anastasia falling in love with the baker thing was actually like after this. I don't know, it's kind of hard to like piece together timelines, but my point of bringing that up is like Cinderella and Anastasia, like their history is not good. Like Cinderella, the only thing that Cinderella remembers about Anastasia is that she was just awful about her. Like she doesn't have the memory of her helping her with the baker in her head. So she's just like, Anastasia, my evil stepsister who's awful to me. And she fucking steps in front of her and defends her. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Wow, that is strength and kindness right there. So Cinderella 2 and 3 were both released over half a century later than the first one, right? I think there must have been a very obvious incentive for the writers to make her a lot more modern and a lot more strong as to be more relatable for modern audiences, which is understandable, and so they did, especially in the third movie. But they did it in a really authentic way, and they didn't make people think that the more modern Cinderella is a whole ass different person. Her kindness and strength and her capacity for forgiveness that I talked about are maintained throughout the three movies, so it feels like she's the same person in the third one as in the first one. Um, even though she has this super strong go-getter in the third movie and a little more passive in the first movie, I think that is because she didn't really know what it was exactly she had to do to gain her happiness, but in the third one she knows exactly what she's fighting for, her love with the prince as opposed to the general idea of happiness. Now she has someone to fight for. And when her happy ending was taken from right underneath her nose with Tremaine's use of magic, she goes after the happy ending that belongs to her. She knows the prince is looking for her and she's not gonna just sit back and allow Tremaine to take that away. We should also allow some room for character development, which we love to see. She could have just gotten stronger and got more of out of her shell as time went on, and that's fine too. Near the end of the first movie, when Tremaine locks her in the attic, some like to argue that she was weak by kind of just breaking down and crying instead of just trying to escape, and I for one would have liked to see her pick up the dresser and smash it into the door, but uh, you know, 1950s, they weren't ready for that. <laughs> I feel like. But I think if I were in that situation, I probably would have also broke down and cried. But you know, it's not like she did nothing. I mean, when Jacques and Gus came to her door with the key and Lucifer was there trying to eat them, she, you know, suddenly got this burst of energy and she told her bird friends to get Bruno the dog because she knew that he would be able to scare Lucifer away. So when the path to the solution is very, very clear cut for her, she doesn't hesitate to go for it. But when she doesn't see a way out, when she doesn't see the light at the end of the tunnel, then she kind of just sits back and gives up a little bit, like loses hope and cries for a little bit. But I think that is very human and I feel like I do that. <laughs> like sometimes when I'm like frustrated and I hit a wall, I just like cry. And then, you know, after the cry, I'll like think about it and I'm like, wait, I can go about it this way. And I feel like Cinderella does that too. Maybe it's because I see so much of myself in what she does that I really like her. I, I definitely would say that her just crying in that moment and not like smashing the door down with the dresser was kind of frustrating, but um, you know, she was probably panicking and didn't know what to do. In the first movie, her clear-cut path to happiness was only blocked by Tremaine locking her in her room for like a total of 10 minutes, and then she came downstairs and tried on the shoe and lived happily ever after, so admittedly that was kind of easy and didn't really necessitate a super dramatic show of strength from Cinderella, but by exploring this time travel thing in the third movie, we get to see what Cinderella would have done if she was pushed a little bit further. In the third movie, after Anastasia fits the shoe and they leave the house for the palace, we kind of see her being like a little like wallowing in self-pity. She's like, boo-hoo, I can't believe this is happening. And then like after the cry, she like realizes that she can go to the palace and the prince will recognize her. And you know, I think she had that determination within her the whole time, and I think it was just activated like when she actually saw what was meant for her go to Anastasia. So in conclusion, Cinderella's a badass and a great role model because of her kindness, strength, and a capacity for forgiveness. And that's pretty much it. That brings me to the end of this video. I really enjoyed making this and I hope you enjoyed it too. Even if I didn't manage to convince you that Cinderella is the best Disney princess, I, you know, at least hope I was able to give you some food for thought. Um, honestly, I don't remember the last time I got so excited about <laughs> doing research for a video and of course it's about a cartoon. But yeah, anyway, that is it for today. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!